pleasure this afternoon to welcome Dr. Alicia Magici as we discuss conserving art and culture through chemistry in our second day of virtual career week in the spring semester of 2021. And this is a conversation that we're bringing about with regards to thinking about the kind of work that one can do in museums through cultural heritage. And one of the things that we're really excited to have Dr. Magici share with us is her career path through chemistry at Spelman College. During this career talk, Dr. Alicia Magici, who is from the class of 2013, will discuss her unique career path as a chemist working in the visual art and cultural heritage field and her 2018-2020 Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York focused on understanding and documenting the production methods of 18th century English and 19th century American ceramics from the museum's encyclopedic collection. Her current work at Northwestern University's Center for Scientific Study in the Arts in partnership with the Art Institute of Chicago provides a unique opportunity to push both science and art history forward through a collaboration effort between scientists, curators, and conservators from around the globe. And just a little bit more about Dr. Dr. Magici and, and her training. As I mentioned before, she is a proud Spelman alumna. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in chemistry in, in 2013. And while at Spelman, she was involved with scientific research both on and off campus through internships with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. She went on to complete her PhD in chemistry at Northwestern University in May 2018. And as an NSF uh, National Science Foundation graduate research fellow, she investigated the interactions occurring between engineered nanomaterials and biometric systems using nonlinear optical spectro spectro spe spectroscopy. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> Her doctoral research was conducted in collaboration with the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology and NSF funded Center for Chemical Innovation. Dr. McGeechee is currently a postdoctoral fellow with Northwestern University, the Art Institute of Chicago for Scientific Studies in the Arts, where she works on an interdisciplinary collaborative team of scientists, specialists, conservators, and curators to bridge the arts and science. Her work with this program takes an objects-based uh, and objects-driven approach towards scientific research with one of her most recent projects focusing on understanding wax degradation behavior to inform appropriate and effective conservation strategies. So it's my great pleasure uh, to bring to the floor Dr. Alicia Magici, uh, who's going to share with us this afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Magici. Thank you for the introduction. I think you've covered most of <laughs> my life's history in that intro. Um, so I'm just going to uh, start sharing my screen once I remember how to do that. So as Cheryl mentioned, you know, I am a postdoctoral fellow uh, with the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts at Northwestern University. But before I get into I, I'm assuming you can see my slides well, is that right? Perfect. Perfect. Um, so before I get into sort of the nitty gritty and the background on a lot of uh, the information that Cheryl provided, I wanted to share this video with you, which walks through some of the work that I've done thus far and illustrates some of the work that motivates me uh, to stay in this field. The project that I've been pursuing has focused mainly on ceramics produced by Chelsea Ceramic Porcelain Manufactory. They're operating at a time where there's so much expansion in porcelain production and chemistry that it's hard to say exactly how they decorated the porcelain, where these sorts of recipes might have come from, whether they were in-house or from something that was published at the time, or even some act of espionage. There are a lot of ways that this information could show up in terms of the chemistry. My background is not in museum science or conservation science, and so this was really my first attempt in my career to step outside of academia. I came in with the desire to combine my interest in scientific research with an emphasis on science education and outreach. The Teens Take the Mad was able to engage with a number of students. And so for me, that really helped me to see the impact that I could have maybe outside of the classroom, but also you know, still giving back to those who are following behind me. 
This has really allowed me to see how I could design a future for myself to combine the science with the outreach. So I know that that video may be a little hard to see, but I can share the link as well. You know, those sidebars are really sometimes distracting. But <clears throat> I'm gonna speak a bit more about the Chelsea Project in a few slides. Um, before I get into that, I wanna share a bit more about where I am and how I got here. So as I mentioned, I'm a postdoc with the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts, which is this joint research initiative between Northwestern University and the Art Institute of Chicago. So we're an inter interdisciplinary uh, team of scholars with these diverse backgrounds who are all working towards bridging the gap between science and cultural heritage research. That's through an objects-based and objects-inspired approach. And I can unpack that a bit as I walk through the talk. Uh, as scientists, when we're talking about cultural heritage, specifically as physical scientists, we are often speaking about the tangible aspects of culture, uh, values and tradition systems that we have inherited, such as sculptures, art, and other physical evidence of the past. But there's also, an intangible part to cultural heritage, uh, which might include things like oral traditions or knowledge or rituals, which are things that we you know, often don't think about when we're handling objects that are nevertheless important. <clears throat> so I thought it was important to start from as close to the beginning as possible and as, as far as I could remember. So I'm, to say, I'm gonna say I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. So shout out to all the Brooklynites on the call. And reflecting on my early life, I think you know I was, always meant to end up where I am today, even if I didn't know it at the time. Um, my parents, they always pushed me to explore my curiosities and to seek out knowledge. And a lot of my childhood memories, or at least the ones that resonate with me the most are you know, the ones I had at Botanic Gardens or, or zoos and museums. But that being said, as a kid, I really thought that I would be a doctor. And that is a career choice that I revisited a, a lot. Uh, throughout my, you know, my life, but ultimately I decided that it wasn't something that was, you know, maybe a good fit for me. So when it came time for me to pick a major for college, I picked something that I enjoy, something that I thought I was good at, you know, and that's chemistry, and I am good at chemistry as well. Um, I also knew at that point in my life that I wanted to do something that was impactful, something that made a difference, but I wasn't quite sure what that looked like at that time. So of course, you know, Spelman where you go if you're choosing to change the world, right? So I'll say for me, one of the biggest drivers for me going to Spelman was my grandmother who talked about it incessantly. She talked about it almost every time the subject of college came up. So I started at Spel my Spelman journey at, uh, with the Women in uh, Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics program, which was a bridge program designed to bring just over a dozen students in over the summer to jumpstart their college careers. Um, that was through coursework and research as well. During that summer uh, and across my time at Spelman, I was able to develop this very sound support system in my peers and the faculty and staff at Spelman. So I know Dr. Payne's on the call, and I know he's you know, since retired, um, but I'm not exaggerating when I say that every recommendation letter that he wrote for me, you know, every program he, he helped me to get into, I mean, everything came to pass that he helped me with. And it was through my connections at Spelman that I was able to secure several internships with NASA. And that's really what helped me shape some of my career goals. One of the most uh, impactful internships that I had while at Spelman was with the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which they had a satellite location in New York uh, through Columbia. So I was able to work with a team of scientists who were exploring carbon storage in Alaskan peatlands and that relationship uh, to climate change. And while that work had its own surprises, one of the biggest surprises that I had during that summer uh, work was that a marsh existed in Brooklyn just off of a major parkway. So here I am, this is, I'm at Four Sparrows Marsh uh, in Brooklyn where I joined a team of researchers to collect a core sample from that site, which was ultimately used to advocate for uh, land protections in that area. So I realized at that time and that, that experience that I really enjoyed field work and seeing my efforts have real impacts in environmental advocacy. So that was something that motivated me to explore environmental chemistry in grad school. So fast forward a few years, I uh, decided to attend the PhD program in chemistry at Northwestern. 
And as a graduate student, I worked with Franz Geiger and the Center for uh, Sustainable Nanotechnology, which again is this multi-institutional uh, center funded by the National Science Foundation. We had over 80 grad students and 14 faculty members all working towards this grand challenge of understanding how these engineered nanoscale materials might impact environmental and biological systems and how we might use this understanding to create materials that are not only societally and technologically relevant and beneficial, but have minimal adverse impacts. Uh, two of the biggest sort of takeaways I had from this point in my life and this point in my work with the center was, you know, I learned how to be a good collaborator, what it meant to collaborate. And I learned how to communicate with people from different backgrounds because everyone in the center wasn't a chemist. We had a lot of biologists, environmental scientists, computer scientists, and everything in between. <clears throat> Towards the end of my PhD, I remember having this conversation with my advisor, Franz, and talking about where I would go next, and what would be the next chapter in my life. And I, at that point, was still unsure of what I wanted to do and you know what I, I wanted for myself. I mentioned that I wanted to maybe possibly work in a museum, but I still struggle with whether I was ready at that time to leave the lab. Uh, to help me figure out you know, what I liked and what some, some of the possibilities might be for me, I decided to intern at the Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago. And that's really one of my favorite museums. Uh, I love to have you know, the hands-on activities and the, a lot, you know, the, the focus on science and scientific history and the ins and outs of all the processes that, that really speaks to me. But I worked in that museum in their education department. <clears throat> Shortly after that internship ended, my, my advisor actually forwarded me an email with a link for the fellowship program at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So it was perfectly timed. You know, I applied, not totally convinced that I would get in, but I also decided that I had nothing to lose by applying anyway. And so that began my career as a chemist working in the field of cultural heritage research. So now I've provided you know, a lot about my journey, my background thus far, and I wanna talk about now museum careers, shifting focus a bit to the museum space and some of the ways that these different roles in museums may come together. So here I'm presenting uh, three different museum careers, sort of umbrellas, examples, um, the conservator, the curator, and the scientist, right? I think those are the three umbrella terms that capture most of what people are interested on the call today. Um, so I've laid these out in the way not to imply any sense of hierarchy, but to show how these different uh, groupings or umbrellas may be integrated into one another. A single institution might house several curatorial and conservation departments to meet the demands of their collection. For instance, conservators who are generally charged with the care of a collection and record keeping of the museum collection may have specialties in handling and treating objects prepared from different media, uh, which might include time-based media, textiles, glass, photographs, uh, paper, ceramics. And they may also be trained in the scientific analysis of art uh, themselves, and they may undertake their own research as well. Uh, curators may similarly have different expertise, focus, focusing on maybe different uh, themes, time periods, regions, cultures, specific media, but they're generally expected to have, you know, a, a deep foundational knowledge of art history. Uh, curators are also generally expected to be, you know, heavily involved not only in the research required to put an exhibition together, but in also this, how that space is shaped for public engagement. So they may work on things like labels and catalogs in gallery programming uh, for a show and helping to manage acquisitions and loans as well. Scientists can equally uh, be varied in terms of their backgrounds, which may or may not include explicit training in museum science or conservation. Um, some scientists in these spaces may be biologists, chemists, geologists, metallurgists, um, but, not, but most, but not all will have a PhD um, training in some science field. Uh, conservators, curators, and scientists may all work together in a lot of different ways, um, some to ensure for the care of the collection, design of gallery spaces, and uh, in gallery programming, and for executing larger uh, research projects. 
So curators, conservators, and scientists are members of a much more extensive, much more elaborate ecosystem, which includes a lot of different players, all of which I'm not showing here. But a lot of the research being done in museums is you know, very collaborative, a very collaborative effort that involves dedicated researchers, historians, collectors, and artists and their families who are all working together to sort of push the envelope on what is known about art and cultural heritage. So um, outside of museum spaces and gallery spaces, you know, these, these careers also do exist in, in private and independent labs, in zoos, aquariums, and, and gardens, and universities, auction houses, libraries, and a number of other institutional styles. So when we're thinking about a, a plan to get into conservation or curatorial work, you need, also need to think about tailoring your background and your expertise to a specific uh, institution type, if that suits you. So as scientists working in this field, we often rely on a lot of uh, different analytical techniques to explore the different dimensions of a project. I put together this list of some of the techniques that you might find in museums. And don't worry, I'm not gonna go through each of these techniques or quiz you on them. But I wanted to illustrate that we may rely on different uh, analytical techniques to tell us different information about maybe surface properties, chemical nature, the structure and age of an object, you know, as we're exploring these different research questions. So I can't do a demo in the lab right now, but I found this interesting uh, video, which I think does a great job of highlighting uh, how an analytical technique might help to address a complicated challenge. So this video is from research, it's from a group of researchers at the University of Kentucky, um, and it walks through the application of com um, computed tomography to virtually unwrap the Ungeti scroll. So I'm gonna share that now. Virtual unwrapping begins by acquiring a three-dimensional volumetric scan of the damaged manuscript. This scan produces a set of cross-sectional images that show the internal structure of the scroll. When viewed as a 3D object, one can clearly see the individual layers of the scroll, but any text on the surface of those layers is obscured from view. In order for a readable version of the scroll to be produced, these images must be passed through our virtual unwrapping pipeline. First, we capture the 3D shape of the layers of the scroll in a process called segmentation. On the left side of the screen, the software moves through the scroll, image by image, tracing the shape of a single scroll wrap. On the right, we see the 3D model that this produces. Next, we extract the ink from the data in a process called texturing. Using the 3D shape generated by segmentation, our software makes another pass through the scroll, this time looking for very bright pixels. Bright pixels indicate regions of dense material. In this case, it was made with iron or lead. We now have a single wrap of the scroll with the text shown clearly on its surface. However, because the surface is curved, it's difficult to read all of the text from one viewpoint. The flattening stage of our pipeline converts this textured 3D surface into a flat plane so that the text can be more easily read. To produce the best results, these three steps must be performed on one small section of the scroll at a time. As a result, we end up with several texture images that must be merged together. This merging process creates a single consolidated image that shows the full text. Using this pipeline, we have restored and revealed the text of five complete wraps of the En Gedi scroll. The two distinct columns of Hebrew writing reveal the scroll to be the book of Leviticus. This marks the En Gedi scroll as the earliest copy of a Pentateuchal book ever found in a holy ark, a significant discovery in biblical archaeology. So hopefully you were able to take, you know, something away from that video. I, I really enjoyed it and I, I was impressed by the fact that we could read something like this all without, you know, out having to unroll the scroll. Uh, but this video also alludes to some of the things that we might need to consider when we're developing an analytical plan. We might need to consider if we want to or can take an invasive approach where maybe small samples may be collected, or if the object is even in a position to be sampled, or if it can be moved for analysis. We might need to think about timeline. Uh, sometimes we're restricted to small windows in time when an object may be installed or deinstalled. Uh, we may have to think about the research, how that research will add to our knowledge and if it will fill any existing knowledge gaps. We might also think uh, or find ourselves asking if it's ethical to do or present research on an object. 
for some objects, for example, the religious or cultural significance may exceed the value that can be added by scientific investigation. Um, but these are criteria and, uh, and these are some criteria that we think about when we're um, discussing what plan we're going to take as we're conceptualizing a project. So uh, I have set up these next few slides in a way that speaks briefly about what drew me into this field. And then I'm going to present a series of anecdotes that I think highlight some of the ways that we might all come together to push this research forward. Uh, so I, I mentioned this, I think, briefly in the video, but I see museums as having a very important role in society, specifically in bringing the world closer, closing the gap across uh, age groups, generations, and space, time and space. And as a child, again, exposure to these institutions, these cultural institutions really shaped me and cultivated the scientists in me. I also really enjoy that you can see exactly where the research is being applied and how it's being used. I love uh, always being able to learn and work on a lot of different projects. And I really love meeting new people and learning about their experiences, engaging with the public uh, about science. So my first experience um, was as a, as a chemist working in this intersection of art and science was as a postdoctoral fellow with the Department of Scientific Research at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I was able to work with some really amazing people while there and explore what it really means um, to be a scientist working in cultural heritage and how I can imagine myself in this career. I attended this workshop on Sunday um, on how to tell your, your science story. And I heard this really awesome quote from Julie, uh, who is a research scientist at the Met. She said, I have two mantras. One is that art is dynamic, not static. And two, mo molecules tell tales. Hearing that just seemed perfectly timed. And it's something that I want you to keep in mind for the stories I'm about to share with you. So over the course of my two postdoc experiences, I have had the chance to work on a lot of different material types, um, including ceramics, metals, paper, stone, textiles, and now wax. Uh, today, I'm not gonna go through all of the projects that I worked on, but I wanna highlight some that I think uh, exemplify different ways that scientists, conservators, and curators may engage with one another in their research. And I'm going to start with the work that I did with the Chelsea Porcelain Manufactory because it was one of my first uh, real projects. Um, but before I get there, I want to say one of the things I grappled with when I started this project was trying to convince myself really that porcelains were, or ceram studying ceramics was really important. What's the value there? Um, and so I had really a lot to learn. But porcelains are typically you know, classified as these decorative arts, uh, but in reality, they're much more than that. Uh, and studying porcelain is a means of dating or more broadly studying ceramics is a means of dating or tracing the movements of people and materials. Uh, ceramics are revealing because they're often simultaneously something that's very functional, they serve a purpose in our lives, but they're also very you know, often treated as treasured possessions being passed from generation to generation and they often bear the marks of their creation. So these wares, you know, ceramic wares, wares usually represent the convergence of sort of art and scientific, scientific and technological innovation. Um, and they preserve the fabric, you know, of the, that all the, the things that went into their making is really preserved in the fabric of the material itself. And so I think once I started to learn more about the value of ceramics and what they could yield in terms of the art historical a perspective, that's the more, you know, the more I appreciated the objects themselves. So this project uh, relied on an interdepartmental collaboration between the Department of Scientific Research, Objects Conservation, and European Sculpture and Decorative Arts, all at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, the overarching goal of the project was to understand more about the artistic practices uh, used at the Chelsea Porcelain Manufactory. And I'm going to say Chelsea, I think, from now on to keep it a little shorter on the tongue. So the Chelsea factory was established in the early half of uh, the 1740s and they operated for a very short time of about 40 years. They did not leave uh, any, any records behind. And so we saw this project as a way of reconstructing this sort of record of the past. Uh, we actually had the rare opportunity to do this work because the Met had just begun to renovate their British galleries. 
So in preparation for the new gallery spaces, many ceramics required uh, conservation work ranging from light surface cleaning to reducing heavy stains, uh, redoing old restorations that had discolored over time and recreating lost elements. And I'll say I did not do the conservation work. This is uh, uh, courtesy of Sarah Levin and Rebecca Gridley at the Met who were able to provide me with this slide and also talk about the conservation background. Uh, but the conservators who were responsible for this work in object conservation worked on over 400 objects over the course of two years. And it was during this process and having so many objects come through that space over that time for examination and treatment that the idea for this project was born. And it explores what is known about the color technology used in the development of these surface decorations being used at this period in time. Of all the different types of ceramics that were being treated for that uh, renovated gallery space, we chose to study examples from Chelsea because they're one of the most and first significant producers of British porcelain. Uh, you know, again, we had access to a large variety of objects from across the factory's lifetime, including a lot of different types of wares um, from useful things like plates and dishes to more decorative pieces like sculptures and figures. Um, and again, this factory has a very short lifetime. So they're operating uh, only about 40 years in England. So it gives us a very narrow window in time in, his in terms of history. Um, through which we can sort of examine the, the production of this center. So revisiting this idea of developing an analytical plan uh, as we're exploring re a particular research question, we had again this unique opportunity to explore the collection because the galleries were undergoing renovation, which that defines our timeline. We restricted ourselves to initially uh, explore non-invasive analysis because so many of the objects in the Met collection were in near pristine condition. And we're not sure that our research question really warranted an invasive approach, since we're mainly concerned with the chemistry of these surface decorations. And although questions arose along the way that required more uh, invasive approaches um, to investigate those questions, you know, those are something that we adjusted as we went along. And lastly, we felt that we identified a knowledge gap. Um, and that Chelsea is regarded as one of the first significant successful producers of English porcelain, yet relatively little is known about their artistic techniques and practices. So we, you know, address a few things in developing this plan um, before we set out. So over the course of several months, we looked at 28 objects. I'm showing 26 here. Uh, choosing these pieces was actually a pretty amazing process because I was able to go into the storeroom with the conservators, the curators, and the collections manager to identify the pieces that uh, we wanted to, to include in this study. So we selected pieces that span the entire lifetime of the factory from the earliest inside triangle period in the uh, beginning half of the 1740s uh, through to the gold anchor period that ended in 1769, although the factory does end in 1784. Uh, we looked for pieces um, that have a lot of different colors so that we could really get a sense of what those recipes were, how they were changing over time, and may maybe how they may be used in specific places on objects. Um, we also completed or included um, pieces from contemporaneous factories like Sev, who's operating in uh, France, and Meissen, who are operating in Germany. There's one other interesting point I want to share here in that uh, and that's about the industry of porcelain production in England compared to France and Germany at this time. So England and in, in France and Germany, there's a lot of financial backing from the from royalty. So they have a lot of patronage from you know, the royal families. And so that's a much different scheme than what's happening in England at the time where it's a much more self-funded process. And so one could imagine that differences in how these factories are funded might shape the types of manufacturing decisions that are being made. So I'm not going to get too much into the chemistry of things today. I, I want to keep things you know, high level, but I wanted to take a quick second to show you this useful infographic, which I think illustrates the chemistry of colored glass um, very well. So I know this is glass, but enamels are fairly similar in that they're glassy um, like materials that are colored uh, in similar ways to glass. And they're often fused to uh, pottery metals and um, glass using heat. Both enamels and glass may be colored in a few ways. One of the most common being the use of transition metal ions. Um, so you can see here uh, cobalt being used to produce 
this blue color versus iron being used to produce this green color can also be used to produce a red color as well. And we also see that gold is used. So this gold is actually in a nanoparticle form or a nanoscale form, uh, which sort of relates back to what I had done in grad school. Um, and I really appreciated seeing this. It's not something that I necessarily appreciated about the utility of gold nanoparticles as a graduate student, um, but it's something that you know, I was really excited about when I first discovered this. So getting back to the project. So we looked at every color on each of those 28 objects to recreate a rough idea of what elements were being used consistently in each color across these objects. Uh, we use this as a sort of indicator of what types of materials are being used to produce each of those colors. For example, in the red and orange enamels, we frequently saw iron, which indicated that an iron-based colorant was being used there. Uh, we found gold here in the pink and purple uh, areas, which indicates that the artisans were taking advantage of the optical properties of these small-scale um, gold nanoparticles to produce color. Uh, but since we didn't have a real record from that factory itself to provide context for what we were seeing, we had to rely on records from other factories or the analysis of uh, other objects from other factories to get a sense of how these results fit in the grand scheme of uh, porcelain production in Europe at the time. What we found was that uh, based on the information that we were able to gather from the non-invasive analysis, that a lot of the colors being used at Chelsea were similar in their chemical composition to those being used at other factories. Um, and that these results were consistent with recipes being produced and published in craft books at the time as well. We did not find evidence that there was a significant change over time, uh, but we did find out a lot about the objects in our collection, uh, including you know, that one of the objects we originally thought belonged to this factory might not. Uh, so I'm going to transition to another story now, but still building on that analytical knowledge that I developed working on that Chelsea project, I was able to join a second um, a project focused on understanding the glaze and clay chemistry of ceramics in preparation for an upcoming exhibition at the Met. So this time we were looking at the wares produced in the Edgefield district of South Carolina, which were being produced by free and enslaved Blacks. And one of the most well-known potters from this period is David Drake. And he was enslaved at the time that these wares were being produced. I think that David Drake uh, sticks out in our minds for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's not only that you know, he was very proficient with his craft, but you know, he inscribed his work with poetry and short phrases. And although slave literacy was punishable at, by law at this time, David left us notes about what certain vessels might have been used for, for whom they may have been intended when they were being made. But I think one of the most important things that he left us was his name. This particular um, project focused not on these vessels, but on face drugs, which are also being produced around the same time. So these vessels have a variety of glaze colors ranging from green to brown and uh, slightly different forms with a wide, wide range of uh, facial expressions. And we really wanted to you know, take our time with this project. Like I said, this is in preparation for uh, an exhibition and it was maybe two years into the future from the time that we started this study. Um, but we wanted to explore a lot of different uh, facets of the production of these wares from where materials were being sourced from, uh, how different international influence were converging and to get a sense of who these might have been um, made for and how they might have been used. The hope was that science might uh, uncover some of the more intangible bits of the cultural heritage that had been lost, and perhaps in some ways restore the identity to some of these uh, vessels. Uh, I enjoyed working on this project because it got me a lot closer to what I originally intended to focus on when I came to the Met, which is on the arts of Black America um, and the Black diaspora. And the Chelsea project was a divergence from that, but nevertheless, you know, it was a Chelsea project that really uh, provided me with the foundation of the, and its hands-on analytical knowledge that allowed me to work with ceramics for this project as well. So uh, for a little background, pottery production in this area, the Edgefield District, is thought to have began sometime around, and uh, sometime in the early 1800s. And historians know that several European ceramicists uh, were selling in this area and around this area and in the North as well. 
Um, so I said we were interested again in the glaze and clay chemistry, but we were also interested in understanding how we might develop an analytical plan for possible field work at waster sites, which are places where you are um, often finding large collections of disposed pottery. And we wanted to get, also get an understanding of what might be feasible in our timeline and might, what might be the most rewarding in terms of information that can be yielded. So this was a um, preliminary study of sorts, something that helped us to guide a, a specific analytical plan. Um, so although it's not apparent uh, looking at this, documenting the chemistry or thinking about this, documenting the chemistry of European ceramics is also important for understanding American ceramics as well, because um, uh, European and American ceramics may often be found in the same waste or sites mixed together. And we know that there was some knowledge transfer from Europe. And that shapes some of the uh, ceramic production at these sites. We also know that the slaves themselves may have had may have contributed their own uh, expertise, knowledge, and experience with the materials to the production of these vessels. So they really do represent a convergence of international influences. From our analysis of the face vessels, we were able to confirm uh, what was previously known about some of these. Uh, pieces, which is that the glaze is iron rich alkaline uh, glaze over a kaolin rich body. On their own, these results aren't that uh, informative, but when taken from taken together with analysis from other objects, similar objects in Edgefield and across the South, we can begin to piece together our understanding of where potters may have gotten their clay, how they might have fired them, how the glazes were being made. And going back to you know, Julie's point, that mantra, art is dynamic. So we can also look at this more dynamic aspect of their production, how these processes might have changed over time and how knowledge was being transferred from culture to culture or person to person or site to site. So I'm including this response by Stanley South to an article that was published by a prolific pottery collector, Georgiana Greer, who participated in a, a lot of the early research in this area. I've highlighted where I want to draw your attention, but I'll summarize to say that Stanley essentially, essentially saying, I saw your article and it made things much more, much clearer for me in the field. And now we're inspired to research this more. You know, I think this is a really good example of how we as researchers might inspire one another to learn more, to keep seeking out long, um, knowledge and to push the research along. Moving to another story, you know, I'm jumping from story to story, but I, there's a connection. You know, moving to the story, one of the earliest pieces, this is one of the earliest pieces I actually was able to work on when I got to the Met. Not so not the longest, not the first project, but the first piece. Uh, and so I'm working on a Mayan lentil here. And here I am in the gallery, actually in the gallery space doing this analysis. So a lintel is something that hangs in the doorway or an entranceway. And this particular piece was produced sometime in the 1770s and it may have hung in a temple. We were uh, asked to identify the different colorants that are evident across the piece. And, and this was in preparation for the renovations that to take place in that gallery. So it's similar to the Chelsea work, which was you know, reliant on or uh, possible because of uh, renovations in the space. This was in anticipation of a change in that, that gallery space. Uh, similar to the inscribed draped storage jugs that I presented. This lintel is important because it is one of the relatively rare examples in which, in, in Mayan art, in which uh, the artists signed their work. So this, this piece is actually signed. Uh, and although you can't see it very well in this picture, this piece is also really special because of the vibrancy of the colors that have endured on um, the surface of this limestone for so long. One of the colorants that we identified on this object is what is known as Maya blue. So it's a mixture of indigo and polygorskite clay. Indigo is a natural organic dye and it's used in a lot of coloring today, you know, for example, in your jeans. And, it's, and Maya blue itself is nearly indestructible and survives harsh chemical environments and environments, different environmental conditions. I'll also say it makes a really fun lab activity to um, show students. If you're interested, I can, can tell you how that's done. It's a really quick, quick process. But um, the chemistry of Maya blue itself and its durability as a colorant is actually what allows it to be studied today. If it were a fugitive color, something that faded over time, um, that did, that's something that did not endure as it does, we might have missed that. You may have missed it you know, in the many ways that the pigment was used in ancient society, for, in, for instance. 
Maya blue is also mutually interesting for chemists, material scientists, archaeologists, and art historians. And many studies have been carried out on Maya blue and its significance and, and manufacture um, in the Maya society and beyond. For example, these two articles explore where manufacturers of this pigment were getting their clay. And based on their studies, they were able to essentially provide evidence that the Mayans were transmitting their knowledge about how to make a color, but not giving the material itself away. Uh, so distinguishing between knowledge transfer versus material transfer. One, pers uh, one paper also found that the present day knowledge used to produce or to source Paligorskites with the clay used to make Maya blue by Mayan descendants was somehow passed on, transmitted across a generation, which is again, another example of this intangible cultural heritage. So science not only tells us about what we see, but it helps us to understand why it's made, you know, what makes it so. And so these sorts of studies uh, help us to understand how different civilizations were together or interacted and how different cultures may approach passing knowledge on. So in that last example, I spoke about how colorants uh, may endure through time. Here, I'm going to talk about how time might work against an object and lead to condition issues that require conservation. Uh, so this project was proposed to the Center for Scientific Studies and the Arts by conservators at the Fine Art Museum in San Francisco. And it serves as a nice example of how research can be both object-based and objects-inspired. In this particular case, we're looking at the late 19th century wax sculpture produced by Medardo Rosso, which had began to present a white powdery surface coating over the last few years. Even after an initial uh, cleaning of the surface, that coating returned. Uh, so we at the center were asked to identify this resurging uh, surface material so that conservation strategy plan might be developed to more effectively treat this object. The development of uh, efflorescence or maybe blooming is not only seen on wax sculptures, but it can also be found in stone, chocolate, or in paintings like this one here. So after identifying the surface material to be fatty acids, we began to ask ourselves, but why? You know, why are they developing on the surface? How are they excreted from the wax? What is the wax? You know, from what is known about Rosso, he was an experimentalist. He liked to explore the processes of making these sculptures and even figures that look similar or maybe in this, made from the same mold may have very different wax chemistries. So after addressing, addressing the initial question of, you know, what is the surface material? Uh, we had shifted to wanting to understand more about what the wax is made of, how it fits with other people's analysis of Rosso's work and how his artistic practices, his choices may lead to this process of blooming. And we hope to, by, that by understanding more about the object's foundation, we can understand how and why it's aging the way it is. Now in this final anecdote, um, I'll say that we can build on this idea of you know, understanding surface material and what that might tell us about an artist. And in this case, we're, we're thinking more about artistic intention, what it tells us about artistic intention. So here is an example of a fragmented uh, Benin plaque that's covered in a reddish clay-like material, which is in the collection of the Met. So this uh, project was inspired by a conservator who had become in interested in this piece because she had noticed that many of the, uh, many of them look different uh, on the surface. And some of the early documented European, European encounters with these objects sometimes contradicted what she saw. Some of the pieces were uh, described as near pristine, having been cleaned and polished, while others noted the presence of this red clay-like material. So complicating this issue even further is that many of these pieces, once you know, they were stolen during the 1892 punitive expedition, were altered. They were covered in oils or painted or cleaned or polished by collectors and some conservators. And in some cases, people even applied the red clay or dirt to the surface to make it look like it was original. Nevertheless, we uh, were interested in understanding if we could identify any evidence that the red clay we see here was original to the object and therefore might reflect an intentional choice to leave it on the surface. Um, in our analysis, we found evidence that some of the clay was heated, which may indicate that it was present when the object was cast and that it was not removed once the object was removed from the mold. 
you know, so it's hard to really speak about intention without understanding or knowing the artist, you know, or knowing about their practice. But perhaps with the more that we explore these objects, we can start to piece together the stories about um, whether these may have been intentional choices or not. Uh, this work was presented in the form of a blog post from uh, for the 150th anniversary of the Met and included some of our electron microscope images showing the evidence of firing. So continuing on this idea of uh, communicating our work to the public, I think it's important that I highlight just how that work is being communicated in this space. So there are of course the formal ways of communicating like you know technical talks and articles and I just showed this example from the story of the Benin Flax, which I was presented again in the form of a blog post. And that's something that we're seeing more and more of across museums as we seek to broaden participation. Uh, social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram are also important avenues that we use to promote our work across uh, these different cultural heritage institutions. And lastly, public engagement uh, through in-gallery programming or citizen science projects. Uh, this is something that's most near and dear to me. I really enjoy being able to engage with the public to talk uh, uh, more about my work and about how science can be integrated into these spaces. And before COVID, I was uh, pretty involved in a lot of different types of programs aimed at getting kids and teens really excited about science and thinking about what challenges they might want to solve in the world. Um, but you know, that's much different now over, over Zoom. Uh, but nevertheless, Multiple strategies are important to engage the public at every level. And I think it's important, it's something that museums are um, becoming more invested in all the time. So I'm gonna jump into um, where I think, you know, how these paths can, can come, you know, into the positions that you're interested in, what we can do to get you closer to where you wanna be. I'm gonna talk about some of the traditional paths. I talked a lot about my nonlinear journey through the field, but I wanna present some more uh, guided, you know, uh, frameworks through which you can think about how to frame your future. So I'm gonna start, um, you know, with cultural heritage scientists since that's where I am now. So as I mentioned earlier, cultural heritage scientists may have a variety of scientific backgrounds that might include something like chemistry, physics, biology, or earth science. And depending on what type of institution that you might want to work in, you might decide to study a specific science. Uh, for instance, if you are considering a career at a natural history museum, like the Museum of Natural History or the Field Museum, you might consider uh, careers in anthropology or paleontology or something similar. And if you know the type of institution you're looking to end up in, that will help you guide your choice. But typically, as you will see with many of the careers, the museum careers we are exploring today, there's a need to do additional training after the completion of an advanced degree. And that might take the form of volunteer work or internships or fellowships. Conservators uh, might typically have a background in science as undergrads, uh, one, but one of the most important things I wanna point out about the museum career path or conservative path is that, um, you're most likely going to need to do some degree of pre-program training before you apply to an advanced conservation or degree program. And this might be a form of a structured program through internships or other ways of developing your initial experience sort of as a conservator. And as I mentioned earlier, there's some people who, ch who choose to get a master's or PhD in sciences in addition to getting a degree from a conservation training program. But no matter which route you, you take, like the museum scientists and curators, again, you'll likely have a period after you complete your academic training where you're engaging in additional training programs. Uh, so in the, for the last track I'm talking about, this is for the curator or the art historian. So curators uh, may have a lot of different undergrad backgrounds as well, some in the science, some in art history or studio art, uh, but most, but not all will hold some advanced degree. Um, the path of the curator, takes is really similar to that of an art historian or an art critic as well. Uh, for PhD programs in art history, you typically need to have been enrolled in an art history undergraduate program and some art history programs, but not all, might offer an explicit curatorial option. But generally speaking, the PhD is where you're really defining your specialty, the sort of lens through which you're uh, are framing your particular expertise. And you might consider to focus on 
uh, classical studies or visual culture on a particular um, on a particular culture uh, in time or time. And that's typically the type of curatorial distinction that you plan to have in a museum. So across the three uh, career paths that I just showed, there are some common things that you can do to prepare yourself for a job in this field. One, you need to expand your background. So this means seeking out training programs, advanced degree programs that will get you close to your goal. You have to take an art history course uh, or more to round out your background. You can volunteer and intern at lot local museums uh, to get experience and also to get your foot in the door. Uh, you can build transferable skills. This is something you, you need to do simply prepares you to do everything or anything. So develop your craft, you know, whatever that is, practice writing critical art perspectives or treating an object. You should maintain a portfolio, whether that be digital or physical, something that really showcases your work and your talent and find ways to refine your communication skills. Then of course, you one of the most common uh, pieces of advice, network. So you define the relevant organizations and make sure that you're maintaining and nourishing the relationships that you're building um, through these connections um, to support you throughout your career. And lastly, if my experience hasn't taught you anything else, I want you to think about applying anyway. And you have really nothing else to lose you know, just by applying. So to summarize, I think our hope that I have shown you how museum scientists can aid in driving and supporting our historical research and how we might provide insight for caring for the objects in our collections and for developing strategies for engaging with the public. Uh, I will just say that for some people, finding the path is, is very clear. And for some others, it takes a lot of trying on different hats and seeing what fits. And if you find that you like a lot of different things, then maybe you have to find a way to marry those different passions. So there is no one road to success. So I'm, I'm rushing now because I realize I'm over time, but I wanna take a second just to acknowledge all of the funding agencies and institutions, the people who've, who've helped me get this far in, in my career. And I also wanna take a, a time to thank the AUC Art Collective for the invitation to speak to you all today. And I would like to open the floor for questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Dr. McGeechee. This has been such a thorough and fascinating presentation. And I, I just wanted to share that um, in addition to Dr. Payne, who's here with us today, um, Dr. Jackson was with us and she said uh, hello and she had to run to another meeting. Um, and also Dr. Renee Stein was with us from, from Emory. And um, I saw, I think I saw um, Lestarsha McGarity as well, just you know, others who are in the field um, with you. We also have students, of course, who've joined with us. And if there are any students, I know, um, I think I saw Neil is on the call. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask away. Um, well, I guess, of course, I guess I'll do a bit of background. <laughs> I've had a bit, um, well, a little bit of experience myself with conservation. I um, interned at a local antique shop during my summer of my um, sophomore year of high school. So it's really refreshing hearing about your experiences and kind of seeing it um, from a, definitely it's a more scientific route <laughs> that you um, took. So I, that's definitely something that was very interesting to me. I guess something that I was curious about, you seem to work with a wide range of objects and my understanding conservators kind of favor certain materials. So I was wondering what material do you enjoy working with the most? Well, that's a hard question. Um, I think I would say ceramics, maybe because I'm by, you know, a little biased and maybe it was one of the first things I worked with, but I also really, you know, like this idea of a story being sort of preserved in the fabric of a ceramic. You know, there's a lot of information that we you know don't necessarily think would be there like you know, maybe were they using open fire pits or do they have closed kilns you know but that tells us a lot about the uh technological development of a society right there's a lot of information that's sort of packed in there so i think i'd say ceramics and they're much more i think easier to work with than things that you know like textiles um things that may easily tear, you know, those are things I tend to avoid. Um, but yeah, so ceramics, definitely, there it is, my choice. 
Thank you, Neil. Are there any other questions from any students or anyone who's here joining us this afternoon? I have a quick question. Thank you, Alicia, so much for that talk. It was fantastic. I was just curious about what the greatest challenge was to transitioning into this work from the chemistry lab. Andrea, thank you for that question. Um, let's see, the, 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 one of the biggest challenges, uh, I think, in transitioning from this more, I think, academic chemistry or tradi traditional chemistry uh, lab space was, you know, understanding that, I don't know, in, in, in grad school, you know, you do things so many times or so often that they become almost regimented. You feel like you, you've got it in the bag, you know exactly what you're doing, you kind of go on autopilot. But when you're working in a museum space, because everything is so different, you know, you always have to be, not to say on guard, but you have to really think on your feet all the time. You have to be prepared for anything because, you know, one, one approach that you use for a certain object or material type will not apply to the next or may not apply to the next. And so you have to always constantly be thinking about that. And, that, and that's not something that I really appreciated before coming into the field. And then also, you know, I don't have um, my, like I said, my background was not in art history. I, I don't have an art history degree to fall back on or to, you know, to, to, to dig into. And so I'm always learning on the job, you know, which sort of presents this very steep learning curve, but also a, a really nice opportunity you know, to think about art history in ways I hadn't actually had the time to think about before. Thank you so much for that, that answer, uh, Dr. Michici. I think it's also a really great indication of how there's so many different career pathways to conservation. Um, and you're one of those really great examples of that. There's another question that's in the chat from Sophie Venetia Croft, um, who thanks you uh, for your talk and then asks, um, I was wondering if you thought the X-ray tomo tomography used to map the scroll is a technique that might prove useful for ceramics. Ooh, um, I'd say possibly. I think you could uh, maybe use that to look at structure. So one of the things that you might um, be curious about is, you know, if there is um, a internal support, for instance. So for figures, you know, some of the larger figures may have had uh, rods inserted into the centers to stabilize a figure, maybe during heating or during shaping. So yes, I think you know, it definitely would be useful for um, for looking at ceramics. I think radiography, again, which is very similar to, to computed tomography. Uh, would also give you the same sort of insight. And I think that's maybe, I'm not sure if that's a more accessible technique, but um, I think computer tomography is, is really something that is still evolving in its applications uh, in this field. Thank you so much, Dr. McGeechee. Um, so we are just at the one o'clock hour and I know that our students are gonna have to go on to class. It's been such an amazing and enriching conversation um, an afternoon hour with you, our lunch hour. Uh, we're really grateful to you for sharing with us your career pathway, your experiences, and also just the really interesting uh, case studies that you shared. They give a, a really broad um, insight and, and look into conservation, not just through um, as Neil suggested, you know, one particular medium, um, but rather through a, a, a whole host of media. And uh, we look forward to continuing our relationship with you and networking with you in, in the future and also to following your career um, as the years go on. I'd like to invite everyone to um, our next panel at three o'clock uh, that's going to be moderated by Lauren Jackson Harris. Uh, and it's a professional development program. Um, you've graduated. So now what? That's the title. So uh, please join us at three o'clock and we'll look forward to seeing you for the rest of our virtual career week on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Take good care and thanks again all. Thanks guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.